I'm really enjoying the, the talk so far. I'm excited to uh, present some recent work in, uh, from my group. Um, so this is uh, all the hard work was done by uh, Kung, Yingzhen, and Tang, um, who are a fantastic postdoc and two fantastic students. Um, and mainly what I want to do in this talk is actually advertise that I think continual learning is a really interesting thing to think about. Um, and we've come up with some algorithms which are good at performing continual learning, but I think there's lots more interesting problems that we've just scratched the surface on at the moment. So what is uh, continual learning? Let's start off with a motivational example. This is a fun game you might want to play by yourself at home. Let's imagine someone's going to give you pictures of tools which are either corner cutters or line pins. And here's some images of those two types of tools. I've deliberately picked tools that you're probably not familiar with unless you're a bricklayer or you work with leather a lot. And we want to devise an automatic method for, for class classifying these things. And the way we're going to do that, because we're machine learners, is we're going to collect a data set. And we're going to use that data set as a training data set. And we're going to make predictions. And these data points are going to come in uh, in an online fashion uh, one at a time. And ideally, we would like to devise a system for performing, uh, for training this uh, classifier and performing predictions which can learn incrementally. By that I mean at each time point when uh, a new image comes in, we can incrementally update our prediction model by just looking at the old model and the new data and I don't have to go and revisit all of the previous data that we've seen so far. So this is really important if you want to do personalization, for instance, uh, quickly. You don't want to have to retrain everything all the time on, on all the data. So that's sort of standard online learning, but continual learning is sort of a beefed up um, more general version of online learning where you might have things like this happen. So imagine you start to see data points like this. This might be a corner cutter, but it doesn't look like any of the corner cutters that I've, I've seen before. And that, as I collect more data, has occurred because the statistics of corner cutters are changing through time as more modern materials get incorporated in the manufacturer and so on and so forth. So the um, input distribution here might be uh, changing over time. This is related to covariate shifts. And again, we'd like to be able to encompass that uh, change in input statistics naturally in a continual learning um, or an online, an online way. So that's one way in which things can get more difficult than just standard online learning. Another way is maybe your friend who likes working on boats says, hey, can I add another class to your, your binary classification example? I, I work with caulking irons, and I'd like to identify those automatically from pictures of, of caulking irons. And you might want to train your classifier to now do three-way classification and not revisit all of the previous line pins and corner cutters that you've seen, seen before. So you want to incrementally add this extra class on. And when you do that, you don't want to stuff up your performance on these other classes that you've already trained your classifier for. So it's a bit of a delicate operation to do that. Um, but hopefully, once you've done that, you can then classify these caulking irons. Then another friend, you have a very uh, geeky bunch of friends, I guess, comes to you with the following task. It says, I want to distinguish rope making wrenches from belay separators. Another classic classification problem. Um, <laughs> and this is a completely separate binary classification task. And ideally, we would like to transfer information from this original classification task over here. Things like handles are a giveaway that we're dealing with a rope making wrench, it turns out. They don't appear on belay separators. So we might be able to transfer some good features that we've learned from corner cutters over here, that they have things like, like handles, and use that to get um, a leg up on this, on this second task over here. And similarly, we might want to use information from this task, task two, this is sort of multitask learning. Um, to do better on the corner cutter discrimination over here, because again, we've learned something about the statistics of handles. Um, and again, we want to do this without vi revisiting all the old data in some incremental way um, that allows us to do sort of good uh, prediction on this new task and doesn't forget critically the original, the original task over here. So we don't want to destroy any of this old information without revisiting those data points. So this is typically quite hard. The classic way of taking, say, a neural network and performing early stopping would be one way around that, but there are now sort of a slew of methods for doing better than that sort of hacky early stopping procedure. And I'm going to talk about some of them in this talk, and, and one which we think is, is up there with the state of the art that we developed. OK, so I need to talk about exactly how we're going to frame this. And we're going to look at this purely in the discriminative setting in this talk, although in the 
in the paper, there's also, we can also apply similar ideas to generative modeling, or well, essentially the same ideas to generative modeling. So here's how we're going to set this up for discriminative learning. We're going to imagine we've got some neural network down here that takes inputs x, passes them through perhaps several layers of a neural network with a set of weights w, gets to the final hidden layer h, then applies um, uh, a set of weights v and gets your outputs, which will be represented using softmax units, and in the original task we looked at, we just had binary classification, so there are two outputs, one for the corner cutters and one for the, for the line pins. So that's sort of the standard static uh, setup. Um, and we could use that standard setup if we had vanilla online learning where the um, inputs were coming one at a time in some IID way. And we could also use that standard setup if the inputs were coming in some non-IID way, so that the probability of an input depended at time n depended on the previous um, inputs that were coming in. So the, and these statistics might change with time, hence the sub n in here. Things get a bit more complicated when we have to deal with changes to the task. So let's talk about how we might encompass this task where we get to see new classes. This is heavily related to online versions of k-shot learning. In k-shot learning, you see new examples of an unseen object before, and you want to transfer information from previous objects. Uh, to, to make you great at classifying these new objects based on a small number of examples. And one way we could do that is we could add an extra weight vector to the top here for this new softmax units, unit that we've introduced and let that represent the probability of the caulking iron label, P of Y, uh, given an input, input X. So we just add an extra weight vector on and train, train that weight vector. Um, so that's how we can sort of handle with new classes. You may want to do something smarter, and that's something I, I could talk about offline. It may be smarter not just to adapt the top part of your network. You might want to add in some extra parameters down here when you see new classes, but we're not going to go there through, through the rest of this talk. And then finally, we have this sort of fourth example, in some ways the most complicated example, where we have entirely new tasks. Uh, this is an example of online multitask learning, as I mentioned before, and heavily related to transfer learning. So how do we cope with that? The way we're going to do that in this talk is we're going to have one head for our neural network, which represents the original task that we had before, where we're, we were telling the difference between corner cutters, line pins, and caulking irons. And we're going to add on a separate set of weights, which is going to deal with the new binary classification task between uh, the rope wrench and uh, the belay separator. So we're just going to tap off the hidden layer. We're going to assume that this has lots of good features in it, like features for handles and things like that, that will be really useful for this new task over here. And then we're going to do inference for all the parameters based on this, on this new task. OK, so the goal for inference, then, is given data, so inputs uh, x and outputs y, to learn all of the variables, the v's and the w's, in this network in order to do, um, make good, good predictions. OK, is the setup clear? This is, sort of the, this is the probabilistic modeling assumptions that we're going to make. Great, OK. Um, and we're going to use uh, probabilistic inference to do this. So one of the reasons why it's really, really important to use probabilistic inference in this continual learning setting is given a new task or a new piece of data at the current time point, we need to wait what that new piece of information, that new data point is telling us about our parameters with what we've learned about the parameters previously from the previous data. And so that needs, needs either explicitly or implicitly, we're going to need some sort of uncertainty measure that balances how much we learn from the current data with how much we've learned before. And so statistical inference, where you maintain distributions over parameters, is a natural way to carry out that, carry out that weighting. OK, so let's talk about that's the modeling slide done. This is the one slide of mathematics when we talk about how to perform inference. And let's just sort of consider the uh, version number four of continual learning, where you have a task followed by another task, and you want to do some training on the first task, and then in the second task, you want to do some training on the, on the information from the second task, but you don't want to have to revisit all the first data. And we'll figure out how to do that using um, Bayesian inference, and it's, it's actually almost trivial. It sort of emerges naturally from Bayes' rule. OK, so here's how we're going to do that. I'm going to suppress all the inputs, so there's no x's which are going to appear on these slides. Everything is implicitly conditioned on the input, and I'm just going to focus on on y's, which are the collection of outputs for our, our current uh, task. 
our theta are the parameters in our network, our W's and V's on the previous slides, the weights, either in the top layer or in the, the bottom layers. Um, and the superscript here indicates that we're in task one. And because we're being Bayesian, we're going to put some prior on our weight parameters. These could be Gaussian priors chosen judiciously according to Alex Matthews' talk earlier, perhaps. And alpha are some hyperparameters. OK, so here's task one. This is the joint distribution. I want, if you, want you to think uh, for the minute that the joint distribution is sort of the goal of approximate inference. Approximating the joint distribution with the data fixed at the observed values is essentially the central goal of approximate inference. Why do I say that? Well, if I took the joint distribution here and I could analytically integrate it, it's in red, which means you can't generally do this, but if I could do that, I'd get P of Y given alpha, and that's what we need. That's the marginal likelihood that we need for learning alpha. And if I then divided the joint distribution by this scalar quantity and normalized it, I'd get the posterior distribution. So um, that's kind of obvious. That's basic mass on the, on the left-hand side here. If I then approximate the joint distribution using Q1 star, using some tractable family like a, a Gaussian, for example, if I n integrated it against theta, which is tractable because it's Gaussian, I then get an estimate for the normalizing constant, which is the marginal likelihood. And I can then rescale by that in order to get an approximation for the posterior. So if you think about approximating joint distributions at inference, you get both the approximation to the model evidence that you need for hyperparameter learning, and you get your, um, your approximate posterior for free. So it's useful just to think about sort of doing both of those things in one go like that. That's one way I prefer to think about things. OK, so here's task one. So we've done our approximate inference at task one. Notice I've assumed the prior is, is tractable here. Um, and we'll talk about various options for what to put in this approximately equal to sign here. There'll be a bunch of different choices. And I'll talk you through some of them. And now let's imagine we get to task two. Let's take the approach of writing down the joint distribution again. So that involves the prior, the data from task one, and the data from task two. There are n data points in the first data set. So there are m data points in the, in the second data set. And now what we notice is, oh, this chunk over here, this bit of this new joint distribution, was exactly what I had up here for the first task. You just take the new stuff and multiply it by the old stuff, right? So what I can do is I can just plug my approximation for this, Q1 star, into this, um, into this term here of the joint distribution. Uh, and this, of course, is the, uh, an approximation to what the first task told us about the parameters and what the prior told us about the parameters. So when I add that in, this is now really nice because it prevents us from needing to access the first task's data when we're at the second task. Okay, we just need to access to the previous approximation and the current task likelihood. So we can do incremental continual learning updates without revisiting the old data. This, of course, is still intractable because I'm multiplying some nice tractable thing, Q1 star, by a set of likelihoods. So then we're going to need to do another uh, approximate inference step to get to Q2 star. Um, which is then tractable, which we can then recurse again. Okay, so this is just sort of online approximate inference, essentially using the previous approximate posterior as the prior for the next task and, and recursing. Okay, any questions about that? Does that make sense? Uh, yep, uh, Will that still be the case with non IID data? Just disentangling of the. Um, it depends what you think. So I talked about covariate shift where the input statistics were changing, in which case this is fine because this is all about the conditional distribution of y given x. If you think there's what's called data sh shift and things like that, you'd need to get more complicated because p of y given theta is in fact changing over time as well. So you're right. Okay, great. All right, let's, um, let's push on in the in interest of time. If you have other questions, we can come back to them. Um, okay, this I'm, I'm going to go through very quickly, but suffice it to say, there are a bunch of different approximate inference schemes in the literature. Laplace's approximation, variational free energy methods, moment matching, and important sampling are four that I've picked out here. If you transfer them to the online setting, we can plug them into the equations on the previous slide, wherever we had those approximate arrows projecting down to a Q. Um, and we get a thing called Laplace approximation, <laughs> online VB, assumed density filtering and sequential Monte Carlo when we apply exactly the operation on the previous slide to those four approximate inference schemes. And what's more, you can then apply these schemes to neural networks. And last year, um, uh, DeepMind 
um, came up with an elastic, what they call elastic weight consolidation, which was essentially applying Laplace approximation to uh, Bayesian neural networks. Um, Miguel has worked on a thing called probabilistic backpropagation, which is essentially assumed density filtering applied to, to neural networks. And Nando and um, others have applied sequential Monte Carlo to uh, neural networks as well. So there's been sort of venerable work in this, in this sort of area before, but sort of oddly missing is the variational extension here. We know variational methods work reasonably well for, for Bayesian neural networks. They're often better than Laplace. So it seems sensible that we should go and try and apply online variational inference where we use KL Q to P to carry out this projection step that I showed you in the previous slide and see how, it how well it compares to at least this version at the, at the top here. Um, so this is, this is what we did. Um, I should say that these two algorithms were not, have not been applied in the online setting before. They were developed for the batch setting, although they use something that could be directly applied to the online setting. OK, so we're going to show you this quickly on two tasks. The first one, which is going to deal with this covariate shift example. Um, these are standard tasks from continual learning, which previous methods have used as benchmarks tasks. I'm not completely happy with them. We could discuss later about the pros and cons of these tasks, but they've become the standard. So this one is called the permuted MNIST task. And uh, task number one is, um, comprises of just classifying MNIST. Task number two um, applies a fixed permutation to the pixels in each one of these classes. And then you have to cate categorize them again as 0, 1 through to, through to 9. So the statistics have changed according to a permutation. And then task two, uh, task three applies another random permutation, and then you have to do it again. So at the end, you have to learn a single network with a single head that classifies ones and all scrambled versions of ones to category one, and two and all scrambled versions of two to category two, and so on and so forth. Um, so it's a bit like the corner cutter statistics changing over time. Here's the previous sort of best state-of-the-art methods for doing this, the elastic weight con consolidation paper that I mentioned, and synaptic intelligence. These are both considerably better than early stopping on neural networks. Here is the variational version, variational continual learning. And here's an enhancement that we introduced where you're allowed to keep around a few judiciously chosen data points as an, as an extra memory that you propagate with you. So you could imagine choosing just a small number of points as an episodic memory that can combine with your sort of course approximation that you're propagating forward in order to improve things. And just to show you that that memory doesn't do very much by itself, here's what happens if you use the, the small number of data points as a memory. It, it's, it's performing around 65%. Uh, OK, I mean, now I guess I have one minute left or something. Um, so I'll quickly go through the, the second sort of benchmark task. This is called split MNIST. Uh, people sort of seem to have lost their creativity for continual learning tasks, so they've gone back to MNIST. Um, so here, here is the, how the way the benchmark tasks work. You should think of this as option four, where we have a bunch of different tasks and different heads to our network for each one of those tasks with a common, um, a common uh, base to that, a uh, body to that network. So the way this works is in the first task, we're going to do zeros versus one in MNIST. This is a bit like corner cutter versus line pin. In task two, we're going to do twos versus threes, i.e. Uh, rope wrench versus a belay separator, and then fours versus five, six versus seven, and so on and so forth. And the hope is we can sort of leverage the features we've learned in this first task to do better in these later tasks, things like strokes, which appear across the space. Again, here is the elastic weight consolidation method and the synaptic intelligence. Synaptic intelligence is really good on this task, which is really interesting. It's an sort of a quite an ad hoc method which comes from the neuroscience community. Uh, so one of the surprises is how well this does. EWC does not perform particularly well. Um, I'm going to blow up this top region of this task versus classification accuracy plot. So you can see the next methods. Uh, the variational continual learning does pretty well, not as good as synaptic intelligence um, and drops off towards the end, but still pretty good. If you add the memory, um, again, you can uh, close the gap a little bit, and this just shows you that the memory doesn't work particularly well by itself, so you need to combine it with this, this propagation. So um, I think one of the interesting things to come out of this is, um, A, Laplace is not so great for this task. Um, and going variational helps, and B, maybe we can get to the bottom of this synaptic intelligence paper and actually find out what it's doing in terms of a approximate inference, and maybe there's a new approximate inference method in there that might uh, perform well in general. Okay, so here's the, 
here's the summary. Um, uh, I think continual learning is a really interesting problem. Um, there's lots of uh, more experiments in our paper on larger data sets and actually generative models like using this for variational autoencoders. Um, some orthogonal directions which I think are really interesting are complex models where you ad adapt more than just the top of your network and you adapt through your network in an efficient way. And secondly, online automatic model building. So imagine that you have to figure out how to build your model as you go and entertain perhaps different structures for data that's coming in. Can we do that in an automated way? Um, there are the papers and I'll take questions. Well, sorry, I, I said you first, so. <laughs> um, so far you were using the data of class one to um, also select class two. Um, could you also think of a way to use the data that you observed in class two to improve the design? Well, okay, so that's something I've not looked at here, but they should do that. So, so when you adapt on task two, you are adapting all of the, um, all of the parameters through your network. And all of the accuracy scores that I'm showing are accuracies across both the current task, I should have said this, and all the old tasks. So, so those accuracy scores are, are telling you that actually we're, we've not screwed up task one. If we did, our accuracy would come, would come way down. But are you actually getting better? Because you observed additional data. Yeah, so you're probably not getting, uh, you're not, probably not getting better. But I mean, the reason you're not getting better often is your capacity limited. Mm -hmm. So your network just doesn't have enough bandwidth to squeeze all the features for task two into the bottom of it. Um, and so it has to knock out a little bit of the efficiency of doing task one. But the hope is that there is some back task transfer because you've learned better features for those other tasks. I mean, this will depend on the task. And it's not clear that MNIST, um, you know, learning strokes for one digit and trenalizing it for another digit is going to have particularly strong opportunities for task transfer. But it's something that we, we should look at, definitely. Subin? Yeah, I think the main, so we've, got, we've become pretty good at doing these things through experience. There are lots of tricks that we use for initialization and to encourage it to do sensible things. The main pathology that's really bad is if you have relatively small data sets compared to the capacity of your network, which you might well do for the first task before you've built up to the last task, is that variational methods will tend to over prune. It will send output weights to mean zero, variance zero, and will let the rest of the network below it sit at its prior. And it's impossible to get back those top networks without re uh, top layer weights without reinitializing them. So I think that's the main pathology for at least mean field VI in this case, um, and that's probably why it's <laughs> not doing as well as the synaptic intelligence. So that would be the, th the thing that I would focus my energies on into fixing. Do we have time for one more? Andrew has one. Yep. Um, a, a, a couple of things. The can you view? Presumably, you can view your bit of memory as a sort of a Gaussian cross spike mm -hmm. model. You could view it like that, yep. So you could view it as the, the spikes being the actual data points, the data distribution that you're propagating and the Gaussian. We're then eventually then projecting that back down to a Gaussian. So the other, way, the other way to view it is it's actually variational message passing, where you update your messages for some of your data as you go along, and at the end you update the, the data that you forgot to incorporate from the first, second, third, fourth, fifth task, but you do it at the end, and therefore you haven't overwritten it by lots of previous data. So it's like changing the schedule in variational message passing. Um, uh, sorry, um, if you use all the memory, if you use all the data, how does that perform? Then you're back to batch. I could yeah. I took off my batch uh, things, but batch outperforms everything here. Yeah, yeah. it's uh, and it's it's uh, five percent above or something like that by the end. Um, yeah, it's impressively close to batch, but there is definitely a performance performance gap. So it's just more expensive. That's why you didn't do it. And it's more yeah, it's more exactly yeah, it's not as fast. Yeah, final question. Okay. Well, you mentioned in very complex networks, but are the modeling models related to lifelong learning? Is it a lot about the evaluation you're doing? Or lifelong learning is the same, is like continual learning. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Incremental learning, lifelong learning, online learning. 
I think it's all the same thing. It's a rebranding as much as. <laughs> Yeah, we haven't done that. So th we've done some other work on few shot learning, which essentially is addressing that problem. That I think that's a really interesting place to go, uh, especially where you have some big data, some small data, some big data. I think that, that would be really interesting to look at as well. Great. Let's thank Rich again for a wonderful talk.